I am so excited to be here this afternoon and so many of you are here, you know, I'm very look, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm currently an artist in residence at Hope International University and as Alina said, I just joined as a board member of San Diego Flute Guild. This is such an exciting year for me. Um, previously, you know, just to give a brief introduction, I taught at Kansas State and Northeastern State University after getting my doctorate um, from the University of North Texas. I got my master's at Manhattan School of Music and I did my undergrad at Peabody. So that's just my um, brief background. Um, you know, when I was offered this chance to do a class with this wonderful group of people, I really thought about, you know, how can I use this time wisely? What do I know best? What really works for me as a performer? And one of the things that I, you know, the best thing that I did as a student was building this daily routine. I like to call it daily routine because there are so many things, exercises, etudes, you know, there are so many um, different things, but I just like to combine it all into a daily routine. And I actually um, have a 45 minute to an hour daily routine that I've built over the years. And as you know, the title says, I do them daily. I really do them daily. And um, I really believe in doing this um, daily routine because it's helped me to become a performer I am today and it helped me turn my weaknesses into strengths. It helped me build confidence and um, I really enjoy doing them because, I, you know, I do them daily. At one point, I, I just memorize everything. I, you know, I have everything in memory and I can do them in front of TV. <laughs> I always have subtitle on because I have to listen to my sound. So um, I have subtitles on, but you know, I do them in front of my TV. This is my daily routine as the title says, and I'm going to be sharing a, um, I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint with you to kind of talk about how I came up and, um, give you kind of examples of what I have as my daily routine. So I'm going to be sharing my screen. Why build a daily routine? You know, I consider it, you know, when you work out, you have to stretch first so that you don't injure yourself. And I consider it as stretching. It's, a, it's the most important part of my um, practice sessions because it, you know, keeps me in shape. It, it helps me really, um, move my fingers, move my air. It helps me build foundation and control that you need to have as a performer on the stage. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it helped me build confidence. And doing these routines will allow you to learn music faster. I'm not bragging or anything, but honestly, honestly, because I do them every, every day, I can say that it takes me about like three weeks to prepare an hour recital. And at one point in my life, and it was like after eight months of giving my giving birth to my first daughter, I literally had recitals month after month after month. <laughs> and I don't really, I'm a person who really doesn't like to repeat repertoire on recitals. So I, you know, did recitals on different repertoires and Honestly, I can say it was only possible because I do these daily routines. It really helps you keep in shape and help you improve in all areas of flute playing because we are covering with the um, daily routine, covering all areas with the daily routine. So before making a routine, it's really important to make a proper assessment. You have to know your weaknesses and strengths as a player and don't feel bad about um, listing your weaknesses because you know in one point they're going to turn into your strengths if you do these exercises you know religiously i would research available exercises i'm going to be talking I'm going to talk about the exercises that I use and I'm a little bit old school. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I used Hafen and Gobert. I used Moise. <laughs> but you know, there are so many resources out there. You can even create your own exercises. You can be, you know, there's so many creative people these days. You can create your own and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I actually encourage that to my students. And um, as flutist, there are three things that are very important, three elements um, that are important. And one of them is sound. The second one is technique. And then the third one is the interpretation or musicianship. So there is a triangle sound, technique, and in interpretation. And I'm going to be talking about sound first, what you can do um, to have a good sound. So with the sound, I like to work on intonation. Intonation, you know, even if you you have the most expensive flute in the world, <laughs> there is going to be some kind of intonation problems. And when you do exercises with the tuner, if you do them for, you know, for a long period of time, you're really going to learn the tendency of the flute. And, you know, over the time, you will really get used to playing in tune and you'll be able to even, you know, play in tune without the tuner. And that's, that's the goal of doing these exercises with the tuner. Um, you have to consider the elements of breathing. Of course, breathing is a big part of making, creating a beautiful sound. I see, you know, breathing and making a good sound is one thing. It, you know, good sound can only happen if you have proper breathing, if you only breathe properly. And breath management is a very important element that you need to consider. And the sound quality in all registers, you have to be, you have to have homogeneous sounds in low register, middle register, and the top register. And it's usually very challenging for fluids to build, you know, round, rich sound in the low register, low register. So that needs um, special attention. And then the next element that I would like to talk about is technique. There are so many elements in technique. There is evenness, speed, accuracy, consistency. You don't want to play by chance. You know, some students say, oh, you know what? It doesn't work when I'm playing in front of you. <laughs> I only make mistakes when I play in front of you, Dr. Sun. <laughs> But, you know, you really have to be consistent with the fast passages so that you can play it successfully on the stage on while you're recording um, uh, when you're feeling a little more excited than normal. Um, fluidity. We always want to sound fluidity because fast passages, it's not, you know, it's not testing you how fast you can move your fingers. It's really... Um, I see fast passages as one of the lyrical parts in the music, and you really have to connect the notes, connect between the notes so that it comes out as a beautiful, fast, but um, lyrical passage. And you have to work on coordination, um, whether it's tongue finger coordination, um, just you know, moving your fingers at the same time. So these are very important elements when you're addressing technique. And then, as I said before, there's sound, there's technique, and there's interpretation or musicianship, interpretational skills. And these skills involve dynamic control, vibrato control, articulation, tone color, and phrasing. You know, I believe what makes a performer interesting is being able to bring out the contrast, the, the ability to bring out the contrast, even if I tell my students, even if you play with the most beautiful sound in the world, if you play Hindi Mit Sonata, which is about like 20 minutes long, if, if you play with the one beautiful sound, how would it feel for the audience? And they usually get <laughs> the answer correct. Um, and, you know, the contrast, being able to uh, build intensity, release from the intensity, um, the dynamic control going from forte to piano. And you know, usually it's harder to control the sound 
when you're playing soft, soft on the flute. Loud playing is easy on the flute. You just apply a little more air and a little more um, strength, power, and you got it. But the soft playing, it takes a lot of control. So building that control through these exercises, is, you know, the daily routines is very important. Vibrato, I don't think vibrato should be played the same on every note, you can vary the vibrato to bring out so much in the music. You know, vibrato is a tool that you can use to express yourself and the speed, the, the depth of the wave, all these things can be controlled so that um, you can use it effectively in pieces to bring out the emotions, to um, induce emotion in audiences. Articulation, you can vary the articulation to bring out so much in the music as well. Um, there is softer articulation, there is harder articulation. You know, when we play 21st century music, <laughs> there are so many pieces that, uh, you know, require you to play almost percussively with your tongue. So these articulation, um, you have to practice tone color. You know, it's just very important. It's like colors in your music, colors in your sound. Phrasing is, of course, a very important part in interpretation. How you phrase, how you, you know, control the lines. It's just very important. So these are the elements that you need to consider when you're building your daily routines. Um, I like to, I like to really touch um, all areas of these elements when building my when I built my routine. And then I like to talk about the structure of a daily routine. Include all elements that I talked about, sound, technique, um, interpretational skills. And there's so many more. Those, what I have on my list is just what I came up with. You can add so much more to it. I mean, it's just limitless. Um, I, it says 30 minutes to 45 minutes every day. I actually, mine, mine is actually 45 minutes to an hour long, but it's, you know, I don't want to intimidate people <laughs> so much with the duration of the daily routine. But before you make your routine, before you build your routine, please make sure to assess your weaknesses and strengths, reflect on how effective your routine is, and adjust if necessary. Some of the exercises I adjust um, depending on what's not working today or what's working really well today. And of course, it being a daily routine, do it every day. And, you know, if you do them so much, you, will, you, you won't even have to try to memorize. It would just be natural for you. So <clears throat> let's go. On, oops. So some of the effective exercises, scales, harmonics, long tones, these are of course, you know, very, very important in building foundation. And like I said, I'm a little bit old school. I like to use Tavlin and Gobert a lot. I use, uh, I um, have my students use them too. I say, you know what, Tavlin and Gobert is your Bible. Believe in it <laughs> and you'll become a better player. Moise, I like to use Sonorite and Grand Liaison. Um, I, you know, that's the book that I relied the most when I was a student, and it really helped me build all the control that um, I have today. Are you guys familiar with these books, Grand Liaison? Yeah. Okay, going on to. So I like to share some of the things that I do. And I would like to demonstrate um, this exercise. It's from Moise Sonorite. This one actually was suggested by my former teacher, Marina Piccinini. She told me, you know what? You need to build, <laughs> you need to play soft, soft dynamics better. And she actually um, kind of gave me this exercise is incorporating the dynamic differences, the contrast, the control. Um, on sonorite. So what I do, what I like to do, this is actually 
the second thing that I do, first thing I start off is the harmonics. I do harmonics first, and then I do this long tone with dynamic control the second. So I'm, my mouth is dry and I don't think can play well. So what I do is I like to start pianissimo with an, without an accent. You know, being able to start pianissimo without an accent is a very important skill that everybody needs to have. Crescendo to fortissimo, do crescendo to pianissimo on the first note, then move on to the next note. And, you know, it's important to do this in front of a tuner because, yeah, <laughs> when you use dynamics on the flute, it's gonna, your, your tuner is gonna go wild. <laughs> so, yeah. To, you can control to a certain extent. You won't, yeah, I, I don't, it, it's, you know, when it goes to to about 10 cents sharp, it's okay, but you don't want to go overboard. You don't want to go to um, like 50 cents sharp. So just, you know, referring to your or tuner to stay within the reasonable range. <laughs> So I, did, I start from soft, I do a crescendo to fortissimo, and then I do crescendo to um, pianissimo, and then I go on to the next note. But um, I, you know, don't, I, I'm not really following the rhythm that's on the page right now. I make the first notes longer, and then I actually reverse the rhythm, I guess. I play the first notes longer, and then the second notes shorter, so. do them it's almost meditating and you know because you want to control or you want to practice breathing and breath management I always make sure to take a nice oh, to breath in between um, um, in between the notes where I breathe so I just make sure you know remind myself to take good breaths so that I can incorporate that when I play solo pieces so that's one of the dynamic control exercises that I like to do. And then, you know what, I'm gonna... This is another dynamic exercise that I love to do. This is from Moise Grand Liaison. Um, this, you know, covers three ranges and it's harder to play softs on, you know, in the higher range of the fluid it's it's hard to control the intonation and the release so you know this one really really helped me as a student i had a hard time you know playing the soft dynamics in the top register but this you know i really recommend if you have the same um problems as i did when i was a student so <laughs> really hard <laughs> you know I gave this to my students when I uh, taught at Northeastern State University and and they were like why are you torturing us Dr. Sun <laughs> but, you know I, I don't mean to do that this you know it's hard it's really hard at first but then it really helps you stay flexible um, it really helps you build a dynamic control so it's like one stone two bird exercise for me I believe, you know, this could be helpful for many of you. So this one I really love to do. And 
Um, and I'll share um, this PowerPoint with you, Lena. Maybe you can upload it on, yeah, yeah. So if you want to, um, after this class, if you want to go back and check it out, I'll make sure it's available to those of you who are here. This is also from Moise Grant Liaison. Oh my goodness. <laughs> when I first went, you know, this one was actually introduced to me by Marina Piccinini as well. She was like, you need to work on this. <laughs> you need to develop flexibility in your playing. And um, when I first had it, I was like, this is impossible. I can't do this. <laughs> because, you know, you're literally slurring from the very, you know, very low register to the middle to the top <laughs> and you're making it smooth as possible you're just connecting trying to connect as much as possible and it was really difficult at first but it really helped me build a this you know the the nest, you know you have to be so flexible with your embouchure and it helped me build that flexibility and i take breaths every measure and every measure i make sure to take a how to breath it's almost meditating for me because I'm taking so many deep breaths, especially on this exercise. So let me just demonstrate it. And it's really you know, this exercise, it works on your flexibility, fluidity of the sound, but also it lets, it allows you to work on getting the homogenous sound in all registers. Because if you don't adjust, you know, a lot of students don't realize how far they're going when they're playing on the flute because we can't visualize the distance when you're actually on a keyboard, you know, one octave is pretty far. Two octaves is, you know, very far. And we need to adjust that much of the flute, but, you know, because it's not visual, we can't see our error. Um, oftentimes students don't realize how much they have to adjust. And by doing this exercise, you learn to adjust, you learn to play with homogenous sounds, you know, with nice core. Um, with this one so i'm gonna go on to measure four <laughs> Has a uh, misprint and then oh it's not this one oh no it's not this one but anyway um so i do this exercise every day again i have them memorized so <laughs> you know once you get into the structure the system of doing them every day you'll be able to memorize really quickly because you know they have the patterns that you will recognize and one exercise that I love, love, love to do is, hang on, let me find it, is Tafanel and Gobert number four. I'm sure many of you know this already, but it just walks you through all the major and minor scales, and it's really effective in building your technique. Evenness, again, when we talk about technique, there are so many elements, evenness, accuracy, um, consistency and I I you know I like to do I like to be very effective I like to be very efficient so when I do this exercise I like to just slur the major ones and double tongue the minor ones because then it allows me to practice you know being able to play fast passages connected and it also lets me practice my double tonguing so let me just demonstrate what I do. You know, you, you're more than, you know, welcome to pick the tempo of your choice. I just like to go fast. I like to gamify it. And I like to, I'm a person who likes to really challenge myself. You know, I want to be able to play faster than yesterday. <laughs> 
I want to be better, you know, tomorrow than today. So I like to really, I really built on the speed over the time. And this is the speed that I like to go with. <laughs> Then I take a nice deep breath, and then I'm going to double tongue the uh, the next minor section. And then I go on. G minor and so on and I really have fun with this one <laughs> as you can tell it really hypes me up it really gets me excited gets me ready to focus um, in my practice sessions and again I like to just kind of since I have it memorized I just kind of sit in front of my laptop I turn on my favorite Korean drama <laughs> of the time I have the subtitles on and I just play on and on with these daily routines so tap the nail four, it's just very, very effective in building um, control over your fingers and tongue. This one is also from Moise Grand Liaison, which is, I guess, you know, I have to say this is my, you know what, I'm going to change. This is my Bible. This, this book, this exercise book really helped me to become who I am today, so I'm going to have to modify that with my students so this one you know it's fun i like doing fun exercises this is very fun it helps you to control being able to um you know shift around in the highs and the lows it helps you work on your coordination of your fingers as well as your tongue so you know i think this exercise is tackling three elements that i've addressed before so you see how it progresses this one you know it's fun <laughs> i love that oh and i was like one time i was doing a master class at the university of north texas um and i was just going over this you know similar thing the exercises that i do with the students at unt and <laughs> one of the students came up to me asked me to stay over and she just recorded me do Tafanel Gobert number four <laughs> exercise. I thought it was so interesting, but I just, you know, ran through, you know, it takes me about like five minutes to go, to go through entire major and minors. And um, it's a wonderful, wonderful exercise again. This one I have on the screen is number seven from Grand Liaison. This one, you know, you get to work on your chromatics, which is, you know, it's just so important. Um, I ask my students, do you like playing fast? And most of them say yes. <laughs> and I say, hey, you must love playing fast because you are a flute player. We are expected to play fast at all times, whether you're in orchestra, whether you're in band, where you're playing so uh, your solo pieces, duets, chamber music, you know, it's just everywhere and you have to prepare for it. When I was a student, when I was in high school, I thought, you know, being young, being immature, I thought you can build technique through learning solos. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, at one point students go through that phase, 
But then, you know, I got to college and I saw these wonderful flute players and I thought, you know what, I, I've, I have to up my game. I have to do something about my technique, my control, my sound. Um, and that's why that's why I started doing this. But anyway, uh, so to just, you know, I'll just play a little bit of it. <laughs> Versus the process. Yeah, so that's what I do. And that's a note to exercise, so very quick. <laughs> Um, that's, that's, you know, pretty much what I have, what I prepare for my presentation. I'm going to, did it stop sharing? I just closed my PowerPoint. I think it did. It um, stopped, but I think everyone has to like X out of it. Oh, okay. So if it says, you know, stream over, you can just X out of the stream. Um, sometimes it looks like you're get, hanging up on the call, but you're not. Just, and if you hang up by accident, you could just join back in. So I guess one of the interesting things about me is that I was born in Korea. I was born in Seoul, Korea, and I started playing the flute in third grade in Korea with a Korean teacher. And one of the things that I thought was very different um, when I immigrated to the States in seventh grade was that, you know, in Korea, they focused so much. It was just so intense. I was an elementary student, but I practiced. I was, you know, it's kind of my mom kind of made me <laughs> to practice two, three hours a day, and it was just very intense. Um, and they focused so much on the foundation, the scales, the thirds, the arpeggios, um, from very young age. They introduced it from the very young age, and I think, you know. Going through that also helped me build good technique, um, good understanding of the music. Um, I would like to just kind of open up the floor and kind of ask if you have any questions. I would love to share my experience, you know, whatever you have questions. It doesn't have to be about daily routines that I built and I discussed about, just about anything, you know, my experience teaching at college, my experience getting my doctor, whatever, you know, college admission process, whatever you guys are interested about, I'm, you know, I'll be more than glad to share and share my expertise. Anyone? Anybody? Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about your preparation for your competitions, um, since you have won so many of them. You know, maybe you can talk <laughs> about um, like how far in advance do you start preparing? Um, or is it music that you have under your belt and then um, that you are always working on and then you compete with it? Or do you prepare specifically for each competition? So maybe just a little bit about that since you have so much experience there. So you have to be very smart. I didn't know about this when I, you know, in my first, second year of preparing for competitions and I wasn't really successful then. And then I, you know, as I got more experience, I realized that you have to be really smart. You have to smart, you have to be smart from the planning point. Um, most of the competition upload their materials, their, their pieces, their requirements in August, late August. And that's where I kind of search for the right competitions. I would say there is one foot association society guild in every state. So that tells me, you know, there are about like 50 competitions every spring. So I would just do my research, kind of um, figure out which ones I want to submit tapes for, because you have to kind of work out the dates. Um, I once had a competition, uh, I once submitted tape and I got into 
both competitions, but they were on the same day. So then I couldn't go to one of them. So you kind of have to um, make a schedule and do that in August or September, early of the semester, fall semester, and then make a list, make a list with the repertoire, the due dates, um, and the competition, the festival dates, and then just kind of go through and kind of eliminate um, that's what I did at least, um, eliminated the competition that I wasn't able to do. And I tried to work it out so that the repertoire was doable. <laughs> so I kind of, you know, if this uh, competition has certain requirements, you know, and this competition allows you to play any repertoire, then it's a good combination. So I would just kind of pair up in a way that it works best for me. Um, my, I think it was like my second year of doctorate. I, I did like seven competitions <laughs> that year, but you know, you have to be smart about it because you can't prepare different repertoire for every competition. Um, so that's how I worked in my second year of my doctorate degree. And I've, through the experience, I realized there are good competition pieces that really helps me sh you know show off what i have and in the beginning stage of my competing years i felt so nervous i was just kind of like in this little box you know i have to do perfect in order to win. i have to play perfectly but you know now i judge so much now that i understand that it's not about playing perfectly well that's also important of course playing with precision and accuracy that's always important but the more important thing is how well are you able to express yourself and to connect with the audience and to to really sh uh, you know show the characteristics and play different from everybody else. What makes your music special? And they really want to hear that also. So that's something that I've learned later. And you know, you get to a certain age and you expire. <laughs> Because most of the competition, the age limit is about like 30. So then, you know, so then I kind of expire. <laughs> so I, I did a lot of competitions in my late 20s. Because when I was in mid-20s, I was in Korea. And I was working at the time. So um, it was when I was working on my doctorate, I did my most competitions. And <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing all of that. <laughs> um, well, I thought this was a really wonderful class. Um, thank you for um, just sharing these wonderful exercises. And I would love to put it on the, the channel right above this one called Virtual Series Discussion. Um, so if you can share that PowerPoint and the PDF, um, I will put it on there for everyone else to also take a look at and print uh, for their own practice. Um, well, um, does anyone else have any questions that you might want to ask? Hi, I have a question. Oh, sorry. There's some background noise. Can you hear me? Yes. Is it Elaine? Okay. Who? Is it Elaine speaking? Hello? Oh, is it? Wait. No, it's Annette. Annette, okay. It's new Hi, Annette. Is that new to the yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I mostly practice like my technique off of the Trevor Y book, but I noticed that in your list, like the different uh, books full of exercises are different. Is there one that's like um, that reaches like talks about different points that you would recommend that like that's not like talked about in the Trevor Y book? Um. Again, there are so many effective resources out there, um, and it's important that you explore other exercises, in my opinion. But, you know, I think it's important to know your weaknesses and know your strengths so that you can address those things with exercises. If Trevor Y is working for you, then, you know, it's the right um, routine, that right exercise that you need to have in your routine. Um, so every exercise that I have, 
at least targets two to three elements that I have in my PowerPoint. Um, and if Trevor Y book is working for you, I would stick with that. But you know, it's important to look around to see what's available, what could be more helpful. So that's my suggestion, Annette. Okay. Thank you for asking the question. Are there any other questions or any other comments? Great job. That was awesome, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's Valerie, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your well, preparation. Well, thank you. Thank you for, you know, for thank presenting you for, this. Thank you for having me. Thank you for you know allowing me to share my experience and what I truly believe in. I hope this you know session was helpful for you. I hope you find the correct exercises, you know, the right exercise that is really effective and efficient for you. Um, and just you know, drill on. <laughs> just you know, work hard and you know you 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 will be able to turn weaknesses into strengths. I like to work. Um, positively. I like to work from my successes. So that's, that's just who I am. Well, thank you so much. This was really invaluable. Lots of really great stuff here. Uh, well, if anyone wants to hang around and chat, you're welcome to. But otherwise, um, thanks for coming. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank, really you. thank you so much, Kristen. So much. Great session. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.